morning. Today is August 9th, and this is the third episode of Bola's podcast. Thank you for those who are still listening. Really, really appreciate the continued feedback. Like I said, I think as I continue to fine-tune the content for this podcast, the purpose and the direction that I want to take with it, the goal is for me to continue to show up every day, at least show up every week to put something on a recording, put something out there, just so that I continue to honor the practice and so that I continue to show up for myself. So I am happy that I'm here in the studio once again by myself. And this may be the format moving forward because I do like the idea of being able to just express myself, but there may be times that it'll make sense to bring other folks in. However, here today, it's a little later than planned schedules were moving around a bit today but you know and I was a bit tempted to sort of just not do the recording today and you know push it to next week but really dug in and decided that in order for me to have the life that I want I have to continue to show up for myself every day so that's the reason that I'm here today and I think that also sort of goes into the topic that I want to explore today that topic is showing up for ourselves in a way that we get to then lean into designing the lives of our dreams. So I've been thinking about this for some time, and for those who are more familiar with my background and where I am at the moment, you all know that I've recently taken a leave of absence from work. I am a management consultant by trade, and generally speaking, that tends to be a very stressful job. I was at a position where I was either going to try to push to be partner, um, what you call managing director, which is a three, four-year campaign where you're really giving all of yourself (laughs) to to work and trying to convince people that you're worthy to be amongst the um, select few who are invited to be um, partners. So along with this, I guess, distinct, you know, recognition, um, there's also some financial gains that comes along with it. So probably about seven months ago, I was having a conversation with my, um, with my MD, my immediate MD, and she essentially was just telling me that, you know, I've now been at my level for a couple of years now, and I really needed to start thinking about how to put forward a campaign to get to the next level. And honestly, particularly given that my children are at an age where my oldest is about to go to college in four years, I really just could not wrap my mind around putting a campaign together for another three or four years to possibly be considered managing partner material. It was enticing because I think When I started my career, I've always been a very competitive person, so the goal was always to get to the top, and that was what I was solely focused on. Honestly, just the idea of being a consultant without going for gold or the highest level just seemed ridiculous to me. Earlier in my career, there would be some people who would say, you know, I'm just happy being a manager, or I'm just happy being a senior manager. I never want to be an MD. And to me, I just could not process that because, you know, what was the point? I was so competitive. And to me, if you're going to do something, you may as well do it all the way. And throughout my journey, um, throughout my career, because I was so focused on wanting to make MD, I have sacrificed so much. My children were very young when I went to business school, ages two and three, and Amy, when I got out of business school, was just a couple of months old. No, I actually was still pregnant with Amy. I had her a couple of months after graduating from business school. So all of their lives, I have been on this grind, um, you know, still just going up the ranks, climbing, working really late, having very little time, mentally being exhausted. There was a point when it started to take a toll on my body. And honestly, the only thing I had the energy for was to get up every day, go to work, put in an insane amount of energy towards my job. And then I would come home and have nothing left to give. I mean, at the time, and thank God for um, an understanding husband, Mac, um, because this is actually a really great period of time for him to really demonstrate his support um, for me because he just stepped in. I mean, he's always been a great father anyway, so there was never going to be a question that he would be willing to step in in that way. Um, But me coming home from work and literally going directly upstairs so I could get some sleep and be able to 
sort of pull myself together um, so that I can get ready for the next day. I mean, that was my routine for probably a good, I would say two years. And I could be wrong because I, I don't know. You know, my memory is not the greatest. Um, so maybe it wasn't two years. Maybe it was six months. I don't know. But the point is it felt like forever. My children were hardly seeing me. I did what I could, but I missed plenty of basketball games, missed parent-teacher conference meetings. I just was not present because I was so focused on work. And I'm now a senior manager, and some will say the hard work paid off, quote-unquote. But what I'm saying is that cost me, that I paid a, a huge price for my current level, for where I am right now. Especially because, you know, at the end of it, what was waiting for me as a senior manager really was more work, more hassle. And yes, there were some pay increases, but I don't think the increase in pay necessarily um, provided significant sort of upgrades in my life or my children's lives. I mean, there were certain things that we could do and, you know, we had some more flexibilities in some ways, but ultimately the reward, at least from a mental perspective or, or what have you, just was not what I expected to get. It, it just was not what I got at the end of it. So I say that to say that since that conversation about seven months ago, um, I really just had to make a decision as to whether or not I wanted to continue down this path. And I think what I'm so grateful for, you know, in having that conversation with her was realizing that, you know, it's never going to be enough. As long as you continue to give your time away so recklessly, and for me personally, so I'm speaking for myself right now, I think I was very reckless in terms of just how willing I was able to sacrifice my time with my family, my health, my mental space, and work all hours of the day. I mean, I would have my computer right next to me. I worked nonstop because I wanted to be seen as someone who was committed to the firm and someone who was worthy of promotion. And there were times that I was passed up for promotion when I was deserving of it. Um, And for whatever reason, I didn't get it. So I would have to double down and work even harder the following year just to try to see if I could get promoted. But ultimately now, you know, after having that conversation, I realized that it's never going to be enough. Number one, I know the lives of MD, and I, and I knew that things would never slow down. So even if I busted my ass for the next three, four years, and I did make MD, I would have missed out on the opportunity to spend the last four precious years with Nuamen and Nubia, who is on um, coming on his heels, who will be um, leaving the house in five years. You know, I will have missed the precious times that I could have spent with them. And they will have left the house, because I know when I left at 17, I really did not come back until, you know, maybe seven years later when I wanted to spend a little bit of time to change careers when I moved from Indiana back home for six months or so. But I was out. So once our children leave, at 17 to go to college, chances are they don't come back. So to me, that was just a reality that hit me like a brick stone, and I, and I realized that something had to change. So that conversation took place last year. And then I also think because of the sort of the deadline of Nuamen leaving and me wanting to really get to know them, spend as much time with them as possible, I think that was also another sort of brick in me coming to the realization that I had to absolutely make a change. And then ultimately, I think what did it for me was realizing that the corporate world just was not where I found joy at all. You know, it was a space where I felt as if I had, I always had to contort myself to present myself a certain way. I think, you know, obviously for those of us who are black or of African descent, you know, for the most part, you know, corporate America is still very much controlled by white men. Um, And a lot of times in order for you to be promoted, in order for you to um, um, be offered certain opportunities, um, you have to present a certain way. You have to fall in line. People have to see you as someone who can relate with a client in a way that they think um, can advance the, the goal of the organization, which is to make more money. And because of that, my natural tendencies not being naturally well-suited for that space, I felt as if 
I always had to occupy a space at work that was not completely myself. So I think what I started to realize more and more was that it was just too much work, too much effort, too much energy. And ultimately, you know, I was spending a huge part of my day occupying a space that was draining. It was taking more from me than was giving me, and I was not being my authentic self. So at the start of 2019, I made the decision that by the end of the year, I had to figure out a way to no longer be at my firm. I gave myself a year to do that. Now, the reason why that, and maybe it's difficult to sort of impress upon the listeners how huge of a shift this would be for me, or this was for me, is I think it's going to be very difficult for me to impress upon the listener unless you've been in this world, unless you've been a consultant, unless you, you know, you truly understand, you know, what that career path means and dictates, particularly having gone to business school and being surrounded by people who are ultra competitive, ultra aggressive in terms of their career goals and where they want to be. And, you know, me always being someone who wants to thrive in whatever that I do, it was a it was a competition that I was willing to engage in. So my job was always not a badge of honor per se, because I never saw myself as I never defined myself as what I did, even though I know there were some people who would look at me and say, oh, well, you know, she's doing this, whatever, whatever, and have certain ideas about it or ascribe certain values to it. I never was attached to it. But I also knew, however, that I didn't want to give up the safety net of a job, nor did I want to give up necessarily the image of someone who is on their path to success, if that makes sense. I think there are certain careers, maybe being a doctor is an example, you know, if you meet someone and they ask you what you did, you know, all you have to do is say, I'm a doctor, and automatically a certain level of respect is ascribed to you. You know, people say, oh, wow, you know, this is a serious person. We need to um, give them um you know, the necessary respect and deference and and what have you. I wouldn't go as far as saying being a consultant is on the same level, but in certain spaces, you know, there's certain benefits or certain respect or deference that you, that are accrued to you because of that. I think while I didn't necessarily see that as my image, you know, being a consultant did not define me. I also did not want to have to explain myself to people who perhaps would then look at me as someone who was unserious. You know, if I said, you know, I'm just trying to do my own thing. I'm just trying to be um, an an entrepreneur. I'm just, you know, you know, I didn't want to have to be met with the look of, does that mean you don't have a job? Or does that mean you're not serious? Or, you know, does that mean you you can't do anything for me, etc. So, so I think there was a huge mental, there was a hurdle that I had to get over mentally. And I knew that it was going to take me at least a year to try to figure out how to detangle myself from this web of my job and start to find my own identity in other places. I had to start to really explore other hobbies, other things that could then start to add more value to me and bolster me up because I felt like I was going to be losing a huge part of myself. So I knew it was going to be a process. I knew the process or of even being able to say, you know, I'm no longer opting into this job because now there's something either equally or more compelling that I'm tapping into was going to be a process. And I wasn't sure that that was going to be the case, to be honest. So I say that to say that this has been a process for me, wanting to find something else to do. And everything that I've talked about in terms of the motivating factors being, you know, I could not give, I couldn't see myself giving another three or four years to make a campaign to be a a managing director. And one thing that I didn't mention was um, our firm is the type, or at least the practice that I'm in, is one where if you are not, it's it's up or out, essentially. At least that's what my understanding was. So essentially, if I'm not um, getting promoted, and if I'm not, you know, going to be an MD, at the end of four years or so, 
I will be pushed out of the firm to, um, or maybe pushed out to other parts of the firm to do something else, but I would not be able to continue down the path that I'm currently on or just stay at the level that I'm on without um, moving forward. And more, more would necessarily be required of me in order for me to maintain where I am. So that's that. So that factor, I wasn't enjoying what I was doing anyways. You know, I found the work to be tedious. It wasn't intellectually stimulating. It wasn't exciting. The people, I mean, I can talk about that some other time. But, you know, to be honest, um, you know, there are times when you're on projects with people that you're not necessarily passionate about or interested in. So all of the, you know, what was going on with work, all of these issues, couple, you know, along with the fact that the kids are getting ready to leave, sort of what the, the motivating factors for me to start thinking about how to design the life that I want. Because what I realized at the start of 2019 was I was spending a lot of time living a life that I did not enjoy. That's not to say that I didn't have moments, you know, at night when I would come home and enjoy my family. I'm very happy with my family. I love my family, love my friends, love the brief moments that I have with them. But I wanted more. And I think I started to have the audacity of wanting to do more. You know, I want to be in spaces where I'm celebrated, not tolerated, where I enjoy and thrive in. I want to be in spaces where I don't have to put on a campaign to be accepted for something. I want to be in a space where I can use my intellect to immediately add value as opposed to someone telling me, well, because you're only at this level, you can't do this, but you know, maybe three years from now, you may be able to do this. I think at the start of 2019, because of all the things that just were not ideal about my situation, I started to question why it was that I found myself willingly going along, living a life that I didn't want. And I think that sort of questioning was the, the, the breakthrough that I needed to start exploring what a life that I want would look like. So around January, that was my goal. My goal was I need to figure out a way to extract myself from my job. It's going to be a long journey. I'm ready for it, but I need to figure out a way to mentally, physically, financially get myself to that point where I can leave with as, as little damage as possible. So I then went into 2019 saying it was going to be my year of yes. I had read the book by the lady who did Grey's Anatomy. I think it's called The Year of Yes. And it was a book where she talked about how, um, you know, similar to the life I'd been living, she had been extremely focused on her career and saying no to, it's Shonda Rhimes is her name, Year of Yes. She had lived, she, you know, she's a huge executive producer in Hollywood. She has a, plenty of shows, including Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, um, etc. that she's produced. So she's very successful, well-respected. And in her book, she talked about how she essentially was just um, missing out on life because anytime she was presented with an opportunity to go out to an event, meet people, make connections, just live, you know, travel, go for dinner, she would just automatically say no because she didn't have time. And I think as she started having children, because I think, and then at one point she adopted a daughter, and she realized that she also did not have time for her child, you know, so her child would say, Mommy, can we um, play a game of um, Scrabble, you know, for instance, and she would be like, oh my God, I, I don't have time for that, and she would say no, so her default was no, and the reason why this resonated so much with me is because this was me, I mean, I, I there was a point when my children thought my favorite thing to do was to... Um, open up my computer and start working. <laughs> you know, there was a time when my kids will tell me, you know, mommy, we know you're very busy with work. You're stressed. We should give you some space. I mean, they just, th th those were the words that I constantly used with them. Um, so they just knew that they needed to give me some space. And I think I related to Shonda's book, The Year of Yes, because, you know, she felt like in order for her to be as successful as um, she had been, she had to be hyper-focused and say no to everything. And I see this a lot in the consulting space. I mean, this happens all the time. So when I read this book, 
and she ta- she ta- um, talked about how there was a year where she just said yes to everything. You know, if someone invited her out, she would say yes. If someone um, asked her to go bungee jumping, she would say, like, if her daughter wanted to play um, something, even if she was in the middle of something that um, was time sensitive, she would take the time out to say yes. Because she really wanted to um, eject herself from this space that she was in where, you know, she was just sort of robotically moving through life but not enjoying the nuances of life and celebrating her accomplishments with her friends and just really spending time with her loved ones. So 2019 was also going to be my year of yes. And one of the ways in which um, I was going to do this was to say yes to whatever opportunities um, came my way, particularly if it had to do with travel. So I think like around March, Nubia, who is my um, middle daughter, came to me and said, Mom, you know, you've already traveled to um, London with Nuwaman by himself. This is when he was one, so it really doesn't count, but okay. And you've already also traveled to Nigeria with Amini by herself. You know, I want to travel somewhere with you. So because I was already in this space of saying yes and also wanting to um, have unique experiences with my children, ones that they would cherish, I said, that's fine. You let me know where you want to go. We're going to do it. So Nubia said she would go to, she wants to go to Paris um, for spring break. So actually, that was the plan. The plan was we were going to go to um, Paris for spring break. And for whatever reason, um, and we don't have time to get into it, we could not make it work. The, their spring break was shortened because they had a lot of snow days. And um, and essentially, spring break was getting taken away from, from them. So it just wasn't going to work. But out of nowhere, my sister-in-law reaches out and says, do you want to go to South Africa? Now, (laughs) and this was within two weeks of her going to South Africa. Did I want to consider going to South Africa with her? The reason I chuckle is because the person that I've allowed myself to turn into would never have entertained that. It just seemed ridiculous. It will have seemed ridiculous in the past. How does one pick up when you have a full-time job, you got three kids, you got a husband, and how do you pick up and just say, I'm going to go to South Africa for about two weeks with 10 days notice? That's just not the responsible thing to do. However, I'm having this year of yes that, that, that I'm in the middle of, and I'm also in the process of wanting to build great experience or craft great experiences for my daughter. So I think what was great about that is that, you know, my mental space was already opening up to have me question, well, why couldn't I go? You know, what would be the issue around me saying yes to going to South Africa? So I think because I was already in that space of yes, it was easier for me to entertain it. So I entertained it. And I said, yeah, I mean, honestly, tickets are pretty reasonable. I would not be taking Nubia. She would not be missing too many days. Accommodations were already, for the most part, planned for, because my sister-in-law had already done most of the work. So really, it would just be a matter of us getting our tickets, and tickets were very reasonable. Um, And me letting my job know, listen, I'm going to be out for a couple of weeks. And for anyone who's in consulting, particularly when you're looking to be promoted and particularly when you lead a team and you're working on a sensitive project, which we were at the time, it's very difficult for you to just say, I'm going to take time off because anything can happen. When you're a consultant, for the most part, it's a very very ego-driven career where you feel like I have to be here to make sure that it gets done right because if I'm not, things are going to fall apart. So I had to sort of get over that um, mental block and say, you know what, I'm just going to go. You know, so I bought the tickets. I put in, you know, at work that I'm taking my my daughter for spring break. I mean, no one batted an eye. I mean, I'm sure people probably said something about it, but it wasn't, I didn't get any pushback. People said, okay, happy to support you. My team was great. And we probably were at a place with my project anyways where I felt 
comfortable enough to step away and I knew that I'll be able to track some of what was going on. And spring break generally is a time when a lot of people in government, um, and my client was a government agency, where they travel anyway. So I, I, I knew that the timing was not too bad. So I went, and I think why this is another sort of defining moment, this trip was another defining moment for me on the journey that I'm on right now in terms of defining the life, or not designing the life that I want, you know, designing a life of my dreams for myself. The reason why it was uh, a defining moment for me is because, number one, it was such a great bonding opportunity for me and Nubia. And it reminded me that the children are not going to be around for much longer. So whatever opportunity that I can get to spend time with them is one that I have to take advantage of. And in in cases where those opportunities don't present themselves, I'm going to have to look to create those opportunities. We had such an amazing time, and I really, really cherished that opportunity to get to know her better, for her to spend one-on-one time with mommy, spend some time with her auntie, be a big sister with her, her cousin. It was just a really cherished time, really enjoyed it. But in addition, I mean, it was just so great to be out in nature. We're in Africa, a place that's a natural space for me to occupy anyways. I love being in Africa. It just reminds, it takes me back to my roots, and I felt like it stripped everything away from me. And I was able to say, yeah, this is how I want to live. We're in Africa. I wake up every day, and I just did what I wanted to do. The weather was great. The food was amazing. The company was was fantastic. And we also were with a group of people who were living life according to their own terms. So, you know, we went for a wedding. Well, the reason Erica was going is because um, a wedding was taking place. And some of her other friends from different parts of the world were converging on South Africa. And speaking with them, meeting them, provided such clarity for me in that, you know, you have to be willing to create the life that you want. Most of them had been living in America. Most of the, in fact, I think all of them had been living in America. And they decided that they no longer wanted to be hustling and bustling, you know, and live the life that America presented because it was just too much and decided to pick up and apply to jobs in other parts of Africa. Some of them decided to um, start their own businesses, and they're thriving. So I think that was also another reason why that trip was such a defining trip for me, because I realized that whatever space you lean into, the universe will sort of bring all the necessary resources for you to carry you through. So that's when I started realizing that if these people who are just as, you know, I'm just as smart as they are, you know, they have just as many baggage. I mean, they got children, they got husbands, they got mortgages here and decided that they weren't committed to living in this space anymore and wanted to explore living elsewhere. And they did it. I mean, to me, it just gave me another confirmation. It affirmed the idea that, you know, I can, you know, design the life that I want. So... I think that essentially is part of really what solidified my quest to fully lean into the journey that I'm on right now. Now, I know we're 30 minutes into this podcast, so we're about out of time, but but I think that's some backstory on why I'm really insisting on taking back my time. So just to wrap up and give a high-level overview of you know, where I am and the life that I'm trying to live and that will further be explored in future podcasts, podcast episodes. <laughs> where I am is insisting on living a life where I no longer have a full-time job. That's not to say that I don't want to work in general. In fact, in order for me to be able to earn the income and live the, live the life that I want, you know, I'm going to have to work here and there. But I don't want a full-time job because I think there's so many things that, that are 
for me, toxic that comes with having a full-time job, especially if it's not yours, and particularly if it's in corporate America, that don't necessarily resonate with me. And I think the price of the price one has to pay to keep that full-time job and to continue to progress and to continue to add value in that space is just much too high for me to pay at the moment. What I want to do is have time and the flexibility to give to the things and the people that are important to me and having a full-time job is not going to allow for that. So that's the one thing. Don't ever want to work on a full-time basis for anyone ever again. The next thing is I want to have my own business. Now, this is probably another full episode to dive into, but there's a lot of flexibility that comes with having your own business. But I think more than flexibility, there's a lot of power that comes with having your own anything, in particular, your own business. I think a lot of us have been operating from a place of weakness, a place where we've been stripped of all of our power. You know, if you're going to get promoted, someone has to agree that you're ready. Someone, you know, you have to put on a campaign for people to promote you to the next level. You know, a lot of times we're going through life, you know, operating from a place of weakness where we're constantly having to present and package ourselves to people so that they can approve or confirm that we are ready or say yes or no. And I think that's a very weak place to operate from. And for me personally, it's very draining. So part of the life that I want to live, part of the reason, well, part of one of the components of the life that I want to live is operating in power. And in order for me to have that, I have to control my finances, where my money comes from. And the only way fully for me to control that is to have my own business. Um, so that's the path that I'm on, and I'll talk more about you know, my experience as I explore this space, um, but that's also one of the motivating factor for me. And then lastly, I think if I'm going to operate from a place of power, what I also realize is that I need to figure out a way to have multiple streams of income coming in and multiple streams of residual income. So not just income that I'm generating myself physically, but income that's being generated either through assets that I have, some investments that I'm making, some business opportunities that I'm opting into, etc. And that's the, the other thing that I'm exploring right now is wanting to identify ways for me to put in place multiple streams of income. And I think with that, with those three things, leaning into a space of questioning the status quo, you know, saying yes to, you know, whatever opportunities come your way, but in particular saying yes to the life that you want, understanding that for yourself and being willing to do whatever is necessary to do it, to accomplish that, is one component. Number two is having the flexibility to work for yourself and on, on your own terms. So not committing yourself on a full-time basis to any job um, in any way. Because the minute you do that, it robs you of so many opportunities. It robs you of the opportunity to spend time with your family, to travel, to explore new skills, to explore new interests, new jobs, etc. So that's one thing that I'm now taking off the table as well. And then lastly, I want to have my income come from multiple streams because what I've realized is it's way too risky to only have your livelihood come from one sole source. And if you're going to operate from a place of power, you've got to have flexibility. You've got to have flexibility. So it's interesting to me that I'm now starting to come to that realization. And I know 
um, through conversations with friends and family members and loved ones, this is uh, an understanding that most people don't necessarily share or embrace. So there's a part of me that wonders and questions why it is that we are willing to pay so much in terms of time and sacrifice and um, satisfaction because we're all, all most of us are not satisfied <laughs> with the work that we do either. You know, so we're willing to pay so much, such a high price to bet on other people, to work for other people just so that we can get, you know, quote unquote, you know, job stability. Um, but we would never in our wildest dreams consider sort of restructuring um, how life could be experienced and redesigning your life in a way that makes sense and naturally flows with your energy and where you want to be. So, so that, that's an introduction to a topic that I want to continue to tackle and unravel here on this podcast is how do you go about designing a life of your dreams? You know, what are some of the mental roadblocks that have been put in place either through institutional sort of brainwashing or some some ideas that we bought into ourselves and how do we extract ourselves from you know that line of thinking so that we can embrace a new way of thinking and a new way of living so with that um, I will bring this week's episode to an end Once again, appreciate those who continue to listen and come with me on this journey. And, um, you know, I look forward to continue to explore and grow and um, discover myself and the world um, with you all. Thank you so much. Have a great week.